Um, uh, my name is uh, Dimitri Zadashev, and um, my day job is SF development, and uh, I do quite a bit of uh, stuff with ECA.net, so I'm really familiar with the, um, the uh, active framework and then that way of thinking about the currency and distributed computing. And, um, and um, as I was writing F-Sharp, I bumped into the limitations of F-Sharp. I, start, I started looking elsewhere. So in my <coughs> projects, I discovered Haskell type classes and all the fun stuff. And I was actually interested in um, any of the actor implementations or incarnations in Haskell. And so I, I was looking around and I saw uh, Cloud Haskell, which is the um, uh, active implementation um, of the, in Haskell. Of the ori originally came from Erlang, then spread to uh, Scala with Akka, and then went to Akka.net for the net world. So, uh, and, uh, and today, um, I'll just talk about my experience of writing a small, real simple of a problem with this uh, framework. And so um, just to show this, um, the serial version of this algorithm is real simple. But basically, you just, I just take initial URL, um, a string, uh, and that would be the first um, uh, page that we visited. And then um, there's also a number of pages that we need to visit before we can terminate this program. And then the output of this would be a, a set of visited URLs and the total runtime for this. And so uh, I just come in, I uh, initialize things, and then uh, as, as long as we haven't hit our goal yet, um, we'll, be visit, uh, we'll be getting one element from the uh, to visit uh, set, and uh, then uh, I would, you would visit uh, that web page, get the HTML, parse HTML, get those links, and then um, uh, do a union between the uh, your discovered links and then the visited links, and then uh, you just repeat this until you. Um, a rich number of uh, uh, URLs you want. And then that would be your visit URLs and then the total running time. And so, uh, and, then I, and then the distributed version of this uh, would be, uh, an idea is to make that part of the algorithm that um, does the heavy IO or heavy, any kind, uh, heavy CPU type work. Take that and, and separate that and uh, bring it out into its own nodes and do that work there. And so um, what I did is um, the, it starts out the same, and then the worker nodes, what they do is they ask uh, a scheduler, um, and scheduler essentially is a, uh, it's a stealing queue, and then they ask schedule for a URL, and then if a URL exists, then they would parse it, they would get the new URLs, and then they would send back the scheduler, the URL that they visited. And then the scheduler, uh, when it initializes, um, uh, it starts off, um, getting the initial URL, and then um, as long as we have, it hasn't hit the total visit count, uh, it would basically just wait on uh, messages from workers, and then if a worker is trying to steal a URL, it would just give it that, give that URL to the worker, uh, and, um, um, and if a worker says, like, I visited a URL and I completed uh, it, and then it would just um, uh, keep, a, keep a track of that, and then it, this also just keeps track of the visit, visited URL, and then the uh, finish in a certain time. And so, um, and um, there's two ways that you can kind of measure performance um, of this and uh, of a, uh, how, what did you get for paralyzing your algorithm? And, and uh, they got like strong scaling and weak scaling. And the difference is, is uh, in strong scaling, they, you, what you do is you uh, keep the problem size constant. And in my case, it was the, uh, the, I, the number of pages to visit was constant uh, as I kept adding more uh, nodes to this. And um, so what you do then is you compare the running time um, of the n, with n number of worker nodes against when you only have one worker uh, node. And that would be uh, essentially the uh, percentage, uh, if it's below 100%, then that, like if you do achieve 100%, then that means you achieve linear scaling. Uh, basically, as, as you add more nodes, basically, um, they efficiently uh, do more work. Um, and then uh, the weak scaling is basically what you do is you keep the workload constant assigned to, um, uh, to one work unit. So for example, uh, you would basically say, um, um, you basically, the, your total problem size increases as you add more work nodes. Um, I chose the source uh, scaling to look at this. Uh, to basically just get an idea if I'm doing something wrong. And so um, just a little bit about the implementation. So I, I implemented this in the cloud Haskell and I basically uh, actual model, uh, it's, uh, it's just async message passing 
and uh, the actors they can live um, uh, remotely. Uh, they don't have they don't have to be um, on the same node, and uh, 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 actors they they have this idea of network transparency where you can refer to a actor or send messages to an actor. If you know it's logical, like, then you can just take that string, you can send mes a message to it. Um, and um, and uh, Cloud Haskell has uh, various levels of uh, APIs. And so the really low level APIs, they don't, they don't look uh, that functional, functional uh, in like the, they don't, they don't look like idiomatic Haskell code. So they look like, like really uh, imperative code and then but they do have um uh, people have built uh higher level apis on top of cloud haskell that you can use and one of them is like uh, it implements the uh, erlang's uh, generic server um, type uh, scenario and um uh, cloud haskell itself has uh it it's uh, net, uh network backend is abstracted so basically anybody can write uh, any kind of network transfer product uh, transfer layer to it and um, I, they have a couple available, and I, the one that seems to, that seems to be recently worked on was like simple local net, uh, and uh, that uses UDP uh, multicast for peer discovery, and uh, essentially it models like the master slave topology. And in my case, that fit well with what I was doing, trying to do. Uh, they also do, they do have peer to peer type uh, network backends. And I I know some there's some projects but they haven't been updated recently. They use like Azure. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they use, but they might be using some of the proprietary Azure stuff, like messaging queue and stuff like that. Um, and so in my case, uh, the master was the uh, the scheduling queue, and then the work the slaves were the worker nodes that uh, were parsing the URL. And uh, I was I also wanted to play with a little bit with um, uh, Nix uh, Nix uh, Nix Ops. Um, well, initially when I, was, when I did this project, um, it was built in the Singularity containers in HPC type uh, uh, type environment where uh, UDP cast was actually enabled, and I was able to do to this. Um, when I was playing around with uh, Next and Next Ops, uh, I I realized that like any of the almost all the clouds they do support UDP multicast, and so the um, the simple local net backend actually does not work in the cloud as is. Uh, but uh, the results that I'm going to share, they, they were basically when I was able to run this in the university tech environment where UTP only test was enabled. And so um, I'm going to show a little bit of code right here. Um, let's go. Uh, and uh, and so, so the way that it, it looks like is uh, you, you just have your main uh, application and, and you have your uh, schedule, scheduler that comes in, you initialize the backend, and then um, uh, you initialize the, uh, the, um, the scheduler. And then, but the other one, the worker ones, uh, they just sit there. And, uh, and, the, and the idea is that um, the, mass, the master node would, would be able to uh, deploy these uh, <coughs> these uh, processes remotely. Uh, and the reason why that's possible is because th this thing called remote table. And, and so basically if uh, somebody tries to request an instantiate an instance on a remote node somewhere else, uh, it would know how to do that because of that remote table. And uh, when, when we go to the master, master of it, so it comes in, it's, it spawns all, uh, all of these uh, worker nodes. Uh, on, on, so this happens from the uh, scheduler um, node, and it spawns all the remote ones. And then it comes in, and um, it just uh, essentially uh, waits. It it starts this uh, it starts this scheduler right here, where um, it it awaits for the uh, it awaits for the uh, messages from the workers. And then if if there is some work, then it would uh, uh, it would give that work to the uh, worker. Um, and if the worker completed the, uh, the work, then it would basically add it to the list of all the crawled URLs. Uh, and then and with controller, um, if we hit our goal of number of the uh, URLs crawled, it would basically terminate this whole uh, process. Um, and so that's the, um, just, that's how the code looks like. Um, 
And um, and when I was implementing this, I also I played around with uh, with uh, uh, Nix uh, and Nix Ops. And so what I ended, essentially what I ended up doing is I ended up creating these system D um, uh, services that would uh, start, and then you would you would be passing in the uh, different parameters and then different environment variables to specify if it's a working order or if it's a um, it was a, 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 a the schedule mode. And when I was, I did uh, get it to the point where I, I was able to deploy this to AWS, and that's what this looks like. So it's really simple, actually. But when I was writing this, the problem was that UDP multicast wasn't enabled, so the workers couldn't discover each other, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, and this, it would have required more work to be, to find another backend that did work in the cloud environment. Um, but the real nice thing about this is, is the fact that I, could, I was able to basically change the deployment uh, target to just virtual box, and I was able to uh, run those in the services and test uh, uh, the logs and see that things are working the way they're supposed to. Um, and so that's how that code looks like. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I ran this in the university uh, environment, basically what I did is I, uh, I got up to running this like, with eight nodes and uh, the worker nodes uh, uh, they look odd uh, because the other node uh, is it, actually the schedule node. So it was a two or eight. And so, and so what happened is um, to uh, reach, to basically get HTML for a thousand pages and then parse that HTML uh, with uh, one, work, uh, one work node it took, uh, a minute and uh, 30 seconds. And then uh, when you, when I doubled the number of work nodes to, uh, actually not double, it was, uh, when I made them three, it basically dropped down to, uh, uh, one minute, and so essentially there was uh, almost a 50% uh, um, improvement, a uh, short scale improvement. Um, the, basically the time uh, to reach your goal dropped down about 30 seconds. Uh, and then when I kept going uh, with uh, seven worker nodes, I, it turns out that it, it doesn't, it wasn't scaling the way it's supposed to be. And so this, uh, so if I was doing this in production type setting, this would be a really big red flag for me that my, something's wrong with the, uh, the way the scheduler uh, node is implemented. And I probably need to look into uh, uh, some other options uh, for that. Um, another thing that could uh, influence this result is the fact that uh, all these HTML pages, the way that they, they, they can visit is random. And then the uh, HTML page size varies. And so that could have had an influence on, in some of these numbers. And so uh, basically, just if you were testing this uh, for more uh, more thoroughly, you would just basically just do, do more tests and see how that performs. And so, the, so the scheduler, uh, it, like it, it probably did become like a, a bottleneck, um, or uh, yeah. And so, to investigate that, you you probably there is in cloud Haskell there they do have uh, these some of these tools that basically they can allow you to log to a local file. Then what you would do is you would go to all these nodes, pull down those uh, log files, and then you would just analyze them. Uh, you, you can analyze the CPU performance, all kind of stuff, um, and then and so basically, uh, depending depending on the level of API you want to work with, it, uh, your code can look doesn't look too functional, and then the strong and weak scaling is uh, it can give you integral performance, and then choosing the uh, backend will depend on where you're going to try to run it, and then a linear scalability is not always uh, tri uh, trivial to achieve. In case you have any questions, I have about one minute left. <laughs> I have a question. So what's your subjective view of like how pleasant it was to do Cloud Haskell development? Um, I came from an environment that was, uh, I already understood uh, actors, I already understood that, and a lot of the high-level APIs were not available. So I got used to like using, um, I could uh, remote, I could uh, remote the cluster, I could uh, remote the sharding, and all these really higher level type stuff. And so, uh, and I, I think, uh, uh, from my perspective, um, if they, if there were higher level type APIs built in and stuff, and I think they're, they have, so recently they have been building like gen, a generic server type stuff. So I think they would have been more pleasant. I could just translate directly some of those ideas. Uh, but, um, I mean, I already kind of had ideas of what I was trying to do. Um, uh, it wasn't too difficult to figure out, but I did find that, so the source code is really good, the really good documentation. They really like, commented, um, commented their stuff. So I can show you an example of what that looks like. So on my machine right here, so there's all of these APIs like 
say I uh, start master. Well, this here's the here's the actual source code for the start master for the code, and uh, the guys who wrote Cloud Haskell they actually wrote really extensive examples in that source code. I found their site site to be a little, 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 little difficult to navigate, but uh, and this I just displays this information, but I really did find that a lot of this stuff is helpful in examples. And so I would say that I, just regular ACA uh, has way better the, uh, the recommendation as it's way more, it's more developed and more used widely, mm -hmm. I would say. Thank you. And that's time. Thank you.